Hello. So this video is going to look at uh, summarizing quantitative variables, uh, specifically using frequency distributions and histograms. Now we've uh, we've done something similar uh, in other videos, specifically dealing with categorical variables. Let me just um, before I get into the quantitative, let me just do a quick little refresh of uh, what what it looked like uh, when we were producing these for our categorical variables. We can keep the same context as, as this problem. So you know, here I have uh, a table of individual student grades uh, in a first year principles macro class. In, in this exercise, I've got um, numerical grades, and that's what makes this a quantitative uh, variable exercise. But let's, let's just consider the, the possible case that instead of having the numerical grades, we have letter grades. So maybe I have A, C, B, C, D, A, I, I don't know, this is a handful of, of letter grades. Uh, and I want to produce a frequency distribution um, and the corresponding bar graph for this data set. So when we were looking at this type of material, in categorical variables, uh, the, the corresponding bar chart was relatively straightforward compared to when we're doing quantitative variable. The reason being is that we already have here our different categories, which became our labels uh, on that bar chart. So we may have, I don't have any Fs, but let's just include all of the possible grades. So F, D, C, B, and A. And these categories were really the, the buckets into which we would throw all of the different observations that fit into the appropriate bucket. So I don't have any Fs, so there's nothing in that bucket. Uh, and Ds, well here I have, uh, I have this one D here, so there's a one uh, that falls into that bucket. Uh, the Cs, I have one, two Cs, so there's two there, there's one B, and there's two As. So when we're producing this bar chart, you know, I had something that then maybe looked like this. And the height of each bar corresponded to the number of observations in each of those buckets. Okay, so there's a very quick, a quick crash review of the bar graphs corresponding to categorical uh, information. Now, when we're looking at quantitative information, as we have in this data set here, the, the, the first step uh, is a little bit more challenging because I don't have these different categories to work with. We need to define what are going to be these categories and then in, in the, the context of a quantitative variable uh, these are called classes. So that's what I've got over here. It's a class uh, sometimes called a bin uh, or as I've been calling them uh, a bucket because it just seems to make sense in my brain that there's a bucket uh, and we throw however many observations into that bucket uh, as is appropriate. So with categorical variables those buckets were defined by each particular category, in this case uh, each letter grade. When we're working with quantitative information, well now we have to define those buckets. Uh, we, have to, we have to explicitly state what is the width uh, of a bucket. And so the width of the bucket will determine which observations belong in that bucket. So let's consider, let's consider two extremes, um, very unreasonable extremes, before we look into uh, something perhaps more reasonable. So if we consider the extreme where we have just one bucket, uh, so one bucket, and this includes observations from 0 to 100. So in this data set, the lowest possible grade is zero, the highest possible grade is 100. In this data set and any data set that I'm working with student grades, uh, as this exercise is, you now all of those observations are gonna fit in there. Uh, here I have, let me see, one, two, three, I have n equals 28 observations. So there's gonna be 28 observations in that bucket. And this is going to look like one tall bar. Not very useful. Doesn't really tell me anything 
about the distribution of grades uh, within this class. Uh, and by class, sorry, I don't mean this class again, I mean this classroom, this, this group of students. So let's look at then the other extreme. Uh, and instead of having one bucket that holds all of the observations, uh, let me just rewrite. We're going to need this again later. Let's uh, let's consider I have a hundred buckets, and each one only holds uh, you know a zero to one, uh, or or is the width of one integer. So here I have a bucket zero to one. Uh, here I have a bucket that would be this would be one point one to two. This would be two point one to three on and on and on uh, until I have 99.1 to 100. So now in each of these buckets there's going to be only those observations that fit between 2.1 and 3 inclusive of the endpoint so a 2.1 fits in there, a 2.2, 2.3 all the way up to a 3 will fit into this bucket. Now Again, is that going to be useful in this context? I have 28 observations. I'm going to have here 100 buckets. Uh, most of those buckets are going to be sitting empty and scattered throughout. I'll have a, a handful of buckets with one or two or maybe three observations in it. For example, I might have out here a bucket that is 60... Uh, I don't know, 60 to 61. Let's just keep the, the numbers simple. So here I have one observation, two. Okay, so there's a bucket with two observations in it. Now most of the buckets, I think, would only have one observation, and there's 62. So here's the next bucket. It's only going to have... So my bar graph is going to look like a whole bunch of these small little, uh, little bars. Again, Maybe in some contexts this might be reasonable uh, to have very finely tuned buckets so you're, you're, you, know, you have lots of repeating values in your data sets. Perhaps this might make sense. Uh, one of the things with quantitative variables in terms of the frequency distributions is that the, the width and the number of classes, the number of buckets that you, that you use, is really up to you or up to up to the researcher up to the person who's doing the analysis to decide how many buckets they want to use and what are the widths of those buckets going to be it's generally accepted that they should all be the same width for example i don't want to have you know how many buckets we're going to have here five buckets in this exercise one two three four five buckets so that's already predetermined uh, the exercise has already provided that limitation. Uh, but I'm not going to go and have, you know, a, a bucket, small one here, another small one, small one, four little small ones, and then here there's a big one. Uh, that just wouldn't make sense. Again, in this data set, I'd be willing to bet that these are each going to have zero. All of these very low value, you know, this is one, two, three, and four, they're all going to have nothing in them. And then this bucket up here will have 28. And here we are again with one big bar. Uh, quite meaningless as far as telling us anything about the distribution uh, of these observations. So what we're going to do here, I've already, uh, the problem's already set up as having five classes or five bins. So how do we determine the width of the bin? Well, we want them to all be the same size. So we can use a, a simple formula uh, where we have the width of the class or the width of the bin is equal to the largest value minus the smallest divided by uh, number of classes or number of bins. Okay, now again, this is a, a, a rule of thumb, it's a method that can be used uh, when you're trying to identify the width of each of your class. It's not carved in stone. You don't have to follow this rule. For in, in this exercise, in fact, I'm not going to. Rather than using my, my largest value and my smallest value within the sample, I'm actually going to use the largest possible value and the smallest possible value. And I'm going to do that because I'm working with a data set that includes grades. Uh, and you know, from, a, from an instructor's perspective, I 
put together this type of analysis for many, many classes every semester of every year. And so those minimum values and maximum values would change year after year, semester after semester. So it's easier uh, in this context to say, well, the largest possible grade is 100. The smallest possible grade uh, would be zero. And the number of classes that we're going to work with is, is five. So my width is going to be equal to 20. So when we put together our, our classes in this, in this first uh, column, now I know each one of those buckets or each one of those classes is 20 integers, 20 numbers wide. So the first one starting at zero, so that'd be zero to 19. Okay, and then the next one, 20 to 39, 40 to 59, 60, oops, <coughs> uh, 60 to 79, 79, and finally 80 to here, I'm gonna round it up a little bit. Uh, instead of 99 here, I'll say 80 to 100. So that now I've got all of my possible values uh, will, will be represented here. Okay, so we've got our classes. Uh, now the, the rest of the exercise is uh, entirely the same as if this were categorical. Uh, information. So now I've got those bins, I've got those classes, now I just need to count uh, how many observations fit or fall into each of those buckets. So we'll start off at 0 to 19. So as I go through my data set, uh, see 0 to 19, uh, doesn't look like I have any. So the first one here is going to be 0. Why don't we also calculate across the rows at the same time so we can use these formulas, uh, the relative frequency is the frequency divided by the number, uh, total number of observations in that sample. So here that is given, here we've counted there's 28 observations and the percent frequency, this is the relative frequency times 100. Okay, so in this exercise, the first row, well, it's fairly straightforward. I've got zero observations. The relative frequency then is zero. Percent frequency uh, is also zero. Moving along, the next class is 20 to 39. So let's, uh, let's go through and count how many observations between 20 and 39. So there's one, two, three, four, I think just four observations, unless I'm mistaken here, I have four observations. So then that relative frequency is four divided by 28. So that's 14, uh, I'll round that, uh, I'll just round it to zero. 14 and finally multiplying by 100 so that's 14 percent of those grades are within 20 to 39 percent okay and carrying on 40 to 59 so let's go through 40 there's one two three four five six six observations there there's six, our relative frequency then is six over 28. So 21, 0 0.21 or 21%. And the next one, 60 to 79. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12, 13, 14, 14 observations in that bin. And so again, our relative frequency, oh, I think I can do this one in my head, 14 over 28, this is going to be 0 0.5, 50%. And finally, our last 80 to 100, so there's one, two, three, and four. 
and that's the same as the other that we did, 14 and 14%. 14 okay, so there we've got our uh, frequency distribution table all filled out and nicely color coded. Uh, the next part of this problem then is produce, uh, to produce the corresponding histogram. So a histogram now is different from a bar chart in a subtle way. And I'll, uh, I'll show you that as we go through, uh, as we add the data onto the graph. Uh, on the y-axis, we're going to put frequency, uh, just because it's um, a little more commonplace to see frequency on that y-axis. But really, we could put relative frequency, we could put percent frequency uh, on the y-axis. It wouldn't actually change uh, anything as far as the, the picture is concerned, all of the sizes of the bars are still going to be the same size relative to each other. Um, it's just changing the scale of the y-axis. So we can produce a histogram using either frequency, relative frequency, or percent frequency. Uh, that doesn't really change anything at all. Okay. Now, when we label our x-axis, so now this is where we put our, the names of the labels of our bins. So this is going to be our first 0 to 19, 20 to 39, 40 to 59, 60 to 79, and finally 80, oops, 80 to 100. And now we can go ahead and uh, add our, our frequency uh, values to our histogram. So first one, 0. I'll just, oh, what happened? zero. Nothing there. Our next one, 20 to 39. So now I'll keep my colors consistent. So here's 20 to 39, four observations, something like this. Now here's the difference between a bar graph and a histogram. If I were doing a bar graph, there would be nothing wrong with just going like this and adding this value on there. That's maybe a little bit too big. And doing something like this. Right? This is what we've done before when we're producing bar graphs. The reason why this is not an issue with bar graphs is that here what I've done is I've left this space in between these two bars. Uh, that indicates to some extent that these two categories, these two bars, have some separation. There's something different about them. For example, when we were doing the, the distribution of letter grades, this was uh, maybe our D and this was our C. There was a natural separation between these two letter grades. When we're producing a histogram, the big difference in that graphic is that it's exhaustive across the number line. And any, any value uh, exists, including those that could exist between 39 and 40. So when we produce our histogram, our vertical bars are touching. They're right pressed up against each other. So this next one, I'll draw it just like this. It's actually going to be a little bit wider, I guess, but that's just a result of my poor drawing skills more than anything else. Maybe I'll make this blue one a little bit wider, to be fair. So there we have uh, our, our next observation, and they are touching, because there's no natural separation between these two groups. The, the, the values flow from one group to the next. So here our next is 60 to 69, and it's pressed right up again. Oh, and it's huge. It's 14 observations. And then the next is 80 to 100. And this is down to 4, so the same as the first. OK. So there's our, there's our histogram. Uh, looks just like a bar graph, with the exception that the bars are pressed up against each other, they're touching each other, because there isn't a natural separation between these different categories. The values flow from one from one value or from one category uh, to the next. Okay, in other words, there's no separation uh, between the upper limit of one uh, bin and the lower limit 
of another bin. Okay, so I hope that helps uh, differentiate a bar graph and histogram and again give us a little bit of practice producing these frequency distribution tables. Okay, thank you very much for watching.